Finished playing at the win. Officially, my biggest losing session ever at live cash games. Feels great. Wouldn't have been so bad. I actually think I played okay today as well. The past couple of days, I've been so burnt out and tired and hung over that I played like shit. And today, I kept my focus and thought I played pretty well. Made some good content at least, so hope you enjoy it at least. It's only cost me $5,000. <laughs> What's happening guys, welcome back to another live cash game vlog. We are back at the win, once again playing 5, 10, and many of the hands have the $20 straddle on. So we sit down with the maximum as usual, which is $3,000, and literally the first hand that I get dealt aces in middle position. I literally didn't even have time to sit down and set the camera up properly, and we get dealt the best hand in poker. $20 straddle is on, so we open it up to $60. The button calls, and the straddle comes along as well. We go three-way to Queen 10 3 Rainbow. Straddle checks to us. I decide to bet $60. I think I can probably bet a little bigger on this board, even three-way, but both blinds fold anyway. I put this hand in the vlog just because it was it was literally my first hand. And honestly, I remember thinking, what a life. I sit at a soft table and get Ace's first hand. Today is gonna be a good day. A few hands later, we look down at a sexy looking Jack 9 suited in middle position. Straddle is on, so we open it up to $60. Button, who is a pretty competent rag, three bets to 160. And the straddle, who is a definite recreational cold calls. So an interesting spot already. I don't think I ever want to four bet this hand three way. And honestly, I'm not exactly fist pump calling this spot. So we're going to be sandwiched in between two players, meaning that equity realization can be quite difficult multi-way. But with that being said, just look how sexy the hand is. So I flick in the call and we go three way again. Flop comes 5-3 deuce with a couple of spades giving us a flush draw. Straddle checks, and there is a world where I would lead here. I'm not too familiar with leading in multi-way pots, but in this spot, we're definitely going to have all the sets, and Button should have none of them. Three-way is a little bit more awkward, though, given the straddle cold call range can hit this board too, so I decide to check. The reg checks back, and so we go to a turn. Turn comes a six of diamonds, bringing in a second flush draw, and now putting four to a straight. Straddle goes for the lead now for $200, and I think calling is just best here. The straddle can definitely have straights and sets. We've got position against him, and so can potentially bluff some rivers. Reg folds, so we go heads up to the King of Hearts River. Straddle bets again, this time for $300, and I don't really think I want to turn this hand into a bluff versus a bet, especially against someone who cold calls, and especially when two flush draws miss. I've talked a lot on stream about spots like this, and I've seen fish call down insanely light in spots where two draws miss, as they like to find excuses to call rather than reasons to fold. So I do elect to fold and lose a medium pot. We are in the $20 straddle for the next hand, and the same regular three bet as last time opens to 50 in early position. Folds round to me, I look down at 7-6 offsuit, not the most amazing of hands obviously, but closing the action, getting a good price to go heads up, I decide to flick in the call. Flop comes ace four three with two clubs and we check. Reg fires out a small C bet of $30 and now we have a decision. So we have a gutter to the nut, so obviously we're never folding. The only question is whether we want to call or raise. So the ace low low type boards are actually really good for the big blind. We're going to have like hands like ace three offsuit, ace four offsuit and five do suited that villain just won't have. And we also have pocket threes and pocket fours at full frequency. So villain may fold some of the lower pairs sometimes in earlier positions. So this board's really good for us. So I think raising is pretty good here. And the way that I'll usually balance, so I'm not bluff raising too often, is I'll always raise my seven six offsuit when I hold the seven of clubs and have a backdoor flush draw. This way we have more equity in the hand than when we don't hold a club and we even block some of villains continuing range like king seven of clubs or nine seven of clubs so i decide to make it 110 dollars to go and villain calls pretty quickly so in comes a six of hearts once again bringing in a second flush draw and i decide to slow down now so once villain calls a flop he's obviously going to have some piece of this likely an ace or better or perhaps a flush draw and even if villain floated with a backdoor type hand something like king queen of hearts he's now going to have turned a flush draw so i don't think betting really achieves much here so i decide to check and villain bets 140 dollars we have a pretty easy call here in my opinion. We can occasionally have the best hand and even if we don't, we can still improve. Most of the time a five, six or seven is gonna give us the best hand. And honestly, I think we can turn our hand into a bluff and don't lead on clubs sometimes. So it's a spot where villain will definitely give us credit for having a flush if it comes in and we lead. River comes a five of clubs, so it does bring in the flush, but also gives us the straight. 
So I think this is a good card to lead on. The reason why we get to lead such rivers is that we're going to have a decent amount of flushes and straights. So leading stops our opponent from being able to check back his hands that were value betting. It does mean villain is less likely to bluff, but I think on this board specifically, he's more likely to have value. He bet called the flop and then bet the turn. So I think he's more likely to have value hands that wanted to get value on earlier streets than have non-showdown hands that are willing to bluff. So I go for the very small size of $100 just in the hope of getting a crying call from something like a set, maybe two pair, maybe even a sticky ace king. Villain isn't having it though and folds, which to be honest, I expect to see very often. And in case you're wondering what I would do versus a raise, I would most likely fold here depending on the size, given I'm going to have flushes here that I'm going to take with the same line. Next up, we are in the big blind. I look down at 10 deuce of spades. There is no straddle in the hand. The button, who is definitely a wreck, opens to 30 and we defend. Flop comes down king nine six with a couple of hearts and the action goes check, check. The turn comes to seven of diamonds and I decide to lead here. The button show no strength and we've got a gutter, so may as well fire it. Villain calls and the river pairs the six and now the decision is whether or not to bluff. And given that I'm a 32 year old adult with 10 high, the decision is pretty clear to me. So I am going to bluff. The only question is what size to go. So we are going to have multiple sizes in general when we bet the river. But for the sake of having a simplified strategy, I tried to figure out what my most likely value bets are and what size they are worth to figure out how I'm going to bluff. For example, I'm not going to bet a nine here for value. So my value is going to be top pair and better. So for that reason, my value bets are generally going to be big, but likely not over bets. So I'm going to bluff with the same sizes as I would with value to be balanced. Now, obviously, you don't really have to be as balanced in live games as you have to be online, but it's still a good way to learn and play a balanced strategy. So I go for around three quarters part, $120. And we get it through. A few hands later, it folds to us on the button and we look down at ace nine of diamonds. We open it up to $50 and both the big blind and the straddle call. Flop comes 9-3 deuce, giving us top pair, top kicker. Action checks to us. I fire out a C-bet of $60. Could definitely go a little bigger here, even three-way, given that we can utilize our overpair advantage. But I think this is fine against, I think we're against two wrecks here. Big blind folds and the straddle comes along to see a turn. Turn comes a four of hearts and straddle decides to lead out for $140. This is probably a GTO approved lead. The card will favor the big blind, or in this case the straddle, more than the button and possibly tip the scales of range advantage in their favor. However, this guy is a fish, so I don't think he knows GTO or can even spell it. So I think we can call. I also think we could still raise here as well. I do decide to call. We keep the pot small and plan to call most rivers, to be honest. River comes the king of hearts, demoting our top pair to second, and the straddle leads again for $240. Really not much to say here. Against a wide range, our hand is way too good to fold, but obviously not good enough to raise for value. So I snap it off. Straddle just snap mocks whatever nonsense he had, and we win a pot just over $1,000. So <laughs> this next hand, there's a bit of a dynamic against the button. Villain is very aggressive, what I would call an ego player. Someone who clearly likes to outplay people, likes to slam down bluffs, even if they're like really shitty bluffs. So just keep that in mind. He opens the $30 on the button. I look down at pocket queen in the big blind and three bet to 140. Button thinks about it for a little while and then puts in the four bet to $380 and the action is back on us. So now we're faced with a decision. There's no straddle in this hand. Villain's playing around 2k. So we start with about 200 big blinds effective. So folding's obviously out the question and I'm not sure if I like banging it in for 200 big blinds. Is Villain really going to stack off here with 10s or jacks? I think by shoving, we just fold out his bluffs that we're ahead of and just get snapped by hands we're dominated by or maybe ace king that we're flipping against. So I decide to call and we go to a flop with nearly $800 already in the middle. Flop comes down 10, 10, 5 with a couple of spades. I check and villain fires out a small C bet of $200. I expect him to bet his range, to be honest. I think in our case, both raising and calling are fine. I'm never going to fold on clean runouts, so we'd get stacked by aces and kings regardless. But there's definitely merit in raising as villain can have some flush draws, potential floats like ace, queen of diamonds with the back door, and maybe still have hands like nines and jacks. I do decide to just call here. In hindsight, I think I might prefer raise, but I think it's close either way. Turn comes a pretty grim king of clubs, and we check once again. Villain has around 1,200 behind and fires out a bet of $500. So this spot's pretty nasty now. Obviously, the king hits villain pretty often. But I start to think, what kind of king x hands would he actually take this line and then fire out a large bet? Ace king would make some sense, obviously. We block king queen. And would King Jack really take this size on the turn? So I think folding is okay here either way. 
if we're not playing five bets pre-flop at this stack depth, we're going to have some better hands. So we're still going to have most of the combos of ace-king, definitely going to have aces and even kings most of the time. But something just felt off about this hand. I really felt as though I had the best hand on the turn at, at the time and figured he would blast this card with, you know, if he's four betting hands like ace-4 suited, ace-5 suited, I think he's always going to barrel this turn. So given how much he has behind, I decide to flick in the call with the intention of calling off on most rivers. So we do call and the river comes a pretty nasty jack of hearts, which is far from a brick. So if he was bluffing a hand like ace queen, now he improves to a straight, although yes, I know we block that. Obviously, I'm never going to lead here and turn my hand into a bluff at this stack depth. So I check and I hear the bad news of villain saying he's all in. I ask for a count. The dealer tells me it's 770 and obviously we don't beat any value here and and we don't even beat that many bluffs now. It's only hands like ace four suited. I do think villain is capable of having all the combos of the low suited ace axe. So I think he's going to bet the king turn with most of them. So it's not just, you know, ace four of spades that we beat. I'm very conflicted in this hand because we've just got so many better hands. But something that a lot of players forget to consider is the price that we're getting. So we'd be calling $770 to win nearly 3,000 here. So we're getting nearly four to one on a call. So if I call and we have the best hand only one in four times, we absolutely print by calling. So about a minute goes by, I eventually count out the chips and slap it into the middle, getting ready to muck my hand. And villain shows me pocket jacks for one of the worst turn bets I have ever seen. So a nice casual two outer on the river. Obviously not a hand that I even considered to be in his range. The turn bet is absolutely awful. What I like to call bet because bet. So boys, when you bet a hand like Jack's in a four bet part, or when you bet any hand on any street for that matter, you need to have a clear directive. You should be betting for value, i.e. to get worse hands to call, or betting as a bluff, i.e. to get better hands to fold. This turn bet achieves neither of those things. I don't call any worse hands with Jack, with the exception of maybe ace queen of spades, which I might just bang it in. And obviously I don't fold any better hands given I literally called the one hand better than Jack's that I could potentially fold. I went over this hand like a million times in my head on the day it happened and honestly i think the only street i didn't particularly like from me is the flop i think i prefer raising i think folding the turn isn't unreasonable as obviously jack should never really be in his range for that size but i really felt as though i had the best hand at the time on the turn and i did anyway ridiculous hand and we lose nearly a 4k pot to a two outer lovely the game is still pretty good though i feel as though i'm playing okay even after losing that hand so i reload back to the table maximum not long after we look down at 10 jack of hearts in early position there's no straddle this hand so i open it to 40 dollars cut off calls and the big blind who is the villain from the last hand comes along as well Flop comes down, ace, nine, five, two spades. The big blind checks, and I check this one over to the cutoff. There's not much going on for our hand here, so I think three-way giving up is completely fine. Cutoff does check back, though, so we get to see a free turn card. Turn comes a queen of clubs, once again bringing in a second flush draw, but it does give us an open-ender. Big blind checks again, and I decide to fire out a chunky bet of $100. So in the previous hand where I bluffed the Tendu suited, I mentioned how we can choose our bet sizes based on what value hands we have. In this spot, we can still have some really strong hands on the flop. We could have been going for the check raise. And now we have hands like pocket queens as well. If we were heads up, I think I'd probably over bet here. But given that we're three way, I decided to size down. Cut off flicks in the call for $100. And interestingly, the big blind over calls as well. River is a total brick, the four of diamonds and the big blind checks once again. Now, I'm not a huge fan of bluffing multi-way but we've got a pretty good combo for it here so we unblock both flush draws which means there's a lot of potentially spades or club draws in both opponents range that we just get auto folds from and honestly even if they have a weak ace x hand here we're representing a lot of strength given that we opened in early position and fired into two players so i put on my big boy pants and fire out an almost pot size bet of 320 dollars Cutoff thinks about it for a while and calls and then the big blind snap calls as well. So I think that's great. I'll just go and fuck myself and flip over my jack high with the thought of, well, I'm just never bluffing again, am I? I can't remember what the cutoff had in this hand. I just know that the big blind scooped the pot with ace nine suited for two pair. Maybe not the greatest bluff I've ever fired, but I was very surprised to see the Agtard player from earlier show up with ace nine suited. Firstly, not squeezing preflop and then just check calling the turn on such a wet board multiway without raising at any point. And then I soon realized that he was locking up. 
So those who play live a lot will know this player type. They win a big pot and then they play no hands for the next orbit or two because they don't want to lose their profit. And then they leave not long after to make it look like they weren't hit and running. Next hand, we are on the $20 straddle. The cutoff opens to $60 and we look down at pocket nines. Definitely a reasonable candidate to three bet sometimes this deep. I decide to just go for the call this time. Plot comes down at 10 at 8 four with two diamonds we check to the cutoff who bets fifty dollars and obviously we have a pretty clear continue you can easily have the best hand still with only one over card to the flop and we have backdoor straight and plush rows raising seems a little bit thin so i decide to just call turn comes a very sexy nine of hearts and we check again villain fires out a large about this time going for two hundred dollars so I think in hindsight here, raising is just a superior play. Even if it does look super strong and there's straights out there, I just think that there's so many hands that continue versus a raise. Not to mention there's infinite river cards that can just kill our action when we just call. So this hand kind of highlights the difficulty of playing out of position where a lot of situations just get a bit more awkward, even with strong hands. In any case, I do just call this time and see a lovely 10 of spades on the river giving us a full house. I check once again, this time definitely planning to go for the check raise. Cut off, thinks about it for a good 20 seconds before finally checking back though. We show the boat and scoop a much needed pot. Not sure what Koff had, but he definitely could have had value. Let's say he had an overpair that could have slowed down when the 10 paired. Which, going back to the infinite river cards that kill our action, even a 10 would kill our action against hands like jacks, queens, or aces. Or maybe he just decided not to bluff given there's two flush draw missed and we have a shit ton of 10x. I don't know. So we take down a small pot, but they all count when you're $4,000 down. <laughs> Next hand, we look down at ace queen offsuit in early position and open it up to $40. And the low jack, the high jack, the cutoff, the small blind, and the big blind all come along. And from the sounds of it, the dealer thinks the straddle is calling as well. He's oh. So the straddle, in fact, doesn't call, and he goes for the squeeze to $360. So this is just an amazing spot to squeeze. There's just a ton of dead money in the middle and most of the players that have called are just never gonna have strong hands. Straddle is playing a little over $1,000. So I decide to put in the four bet here and make it 1,000 straight. We do well enough against some hands like nines, tens, jacks, and there is a world where he just folds. This is not that world, however. He announces all in, which ends up being another $70 more. And we snap it off. Once or twice, twice. Ace Queen. <laughs> so villain shows Ace King, a bit of a cooler in this spot. I'm fine with getting it in. We run it twice as requested. The first board bricks out, but the second flop does bring a queen. The only problem is it also brings a king. Turn and river brick out, so we lose yet another pot, a little shy of $2,400. Next hand is a bomb pot, boys and girls. If you are unfamiliar with these, they happen every dealer change. Every player posts $50 and we go straight to a flop. Or in this case, flops as we play two boards. I actually love the dynamics of bomb pots in general. In fact, my last YouTube video has me playing a $3,000 bomb pot on ACR poker. So go and check that out. And especially when you play two boards, you can have a lot of fun in certain spots. We look down at 7-6 off suit and the boards run out 8-8-6 eight, eight, for the first flop and queen-queen three on the second. We are seven handed and the action checks through. So we go to a couple of turns. Top board, we see the five of hearts and the bottom comes the seven of diamonds. So we have a reasonable piece of both boards here. Nobody's shown any strength on the flop and you really don't see people trap too often in bomb pots. So when it checks to me, I fire out around half pot, $180. And we get the job done and take down another small pot. In this hand, we find ourselves on the button with Ace King offsuit. The action folds to us, so we open to $50. Big blind calls, and the straddle, who is an absolute whopper, calls as well. Flop comes Jack Jack 4, two hearts, and action checks to me. I decide to go for a small C bet here in position, about a quarter pot, $40. Big blind calls, and the straddle calls as well. Turn is a decent ish one for us. It comes the King of Hearts. Both players check, and I decide to check back here. It's a little difficult to get value from that many worse hands now. So obviously the flush came in. There's two jacks on the flop. What really is going to call here? Is a four going to call? Maybe I should have bet because the straddle is a bit of a station. So I can probably get value from some worse hands as well as protect my hand from a fourth heart roller now. Anyway, we do decide to check and the river does come a fourth heart, comes a six of hearts. It does check to me. 
Obviously, way too thin to value bet now, and we don't want to bluff. So I check back. I instantly announced two pair because just to speed up the game. Big blind snap mock, so I don't know what he had. And the straddle shows 8-9 offsuit with the 8 of hearts. So I put this hand in just to give you an idea of the game I was playing in and the fact that I was losing $4,000 at this point. So exactly one orbit later, we are on the button again. The cutoff opens to $50 and we look down at ace-king offsuit. So usually a spot where we're always going to three bet, but... Given that the straddle is the whopper from the last hand and he's been really, really loose and aggressive, I decide to just call here. Basically going for the trap, the straddle can then potentially 3-bet light or even if he just calls, I want to play post-flop with this guy. Straddle does exactly that, just calls, so we go 3-way to a flop. Flop comes down, 7-4 deuce rainbow. Straddle checks to the cutoff, who bets $50. I call here, still can easily have the best hand and two overs to the board as well. Whopper gets out the way, and so we go heads up to a turn. Turn comes a five of hearts, bringing in a flush draw now, and the cutoff decides to go for a larger bet now of $200. So obviously we still have ace high here, but I think that we can have the best hand quite often. So we unblock hearts here as well, which is good. So we can still barrel ace high or king high flush draws. And again, we still have two overs to the board and now a gut shot as well. So even if we are behind, we're likely to still have some outs. So I decided to call here. The river comes a relative brick, the jack of spades. Cut off now slows down and goes for the check. And I think we can just show down this hand. I don't think we're going to get him off something like tens or nines. So I think it's best to just check back and take what showdown that we have. So we do check back. The cutoff shows ace queen off suit. We table our ace king to win the last pot of the night. So the day after the biggest losing session I'd ever had, I decided the next session I would play at the Bellagio instead. The cap is smaller, and honestly, I think I prefer the vibe there. And seeing as it was my last night in Vegas, I wanted a more relaxed kind of session to close out the trip. So we sit for the maximum of $1,500 soon after we pick up Queen Jack offsuit on the button. The $20 straddle is on this hand, so I make it $50 to go. Big blind calls, and the straddle comes along as well. So we go three-way to a flop of Queen 9-7. Action checks to me, and I decide to check this one back. I think with some of our weaker top pairs, when we're playing multi-way, just checking back and controlling the pot size is fine. Turn comes a four of hearts, and the straddle now leads for a puny bet of $30. So this is only around 20% pot. We've got a somewhat disguised top pair, so I raise it up and make it $100 to go. Big blind gets out of the way, and the straddle calls the raise. River comes the ace of diamonds, straddle checks to us, and I think we just have to check here. Something to remember that value betting isn't just about how likely it is you've got the best hand, you've also got to consider how often you can get called by a worse hand when you do bet. So in this case, I don't think he's really going to call many worse hands, so I check back. Straddle tables 9-5 off suit, and we table our queen jack to win our first pot of the night. Exactly one orbit later, we pick up jack nine of clubs on the button, folds to us again, and we make it $30. Small blind folds and the big blind calls, so we go heads up. Flop comes queen jack to rainbow, big blind checks, and I go for the check back. I think either is fine. Turn comes the two of diamonds, villain checks, and I once again go for the check back. River comes the eight of hearts, and villain now puts out a slight over bet, betting $80 into a pot of 65. So obviously, I'm not going to check back twice just to fold to one bet. I put in the one chip call and villain mucks, so we take it down. Now, obviously, this isn't exactly a monster pot, but I think it's a fun one to talk about. I saw a story on Pads' Instagram not long ago. He was trapping on multiple streets, I think, with a set, and he was talking about how do we get the maximum from the bottom of villain's range. And I think it's a really good way to think about certain spots. So in this case, how can we get the maximum from hands that are drawing thin or possibly even drawing dead? So hands like 5-6 suited, 7-8 suited, for example, how do we get the maximum from those hands and it'd be checking back on two streets. Just something to think about next time you're in a spot with a marginal hand or even a good hand. Maybe don't think about how you get the maximum from the top of their range from their weaker pairs. Maybe think about how we get it from just complete nonsense. Next hand, we look down at pocket sevens under the gun and open it up to $30. Button, who is a pretty aggressive player, calls, and the big blind comes along as well. We go three-way to an 8-6-5 flop. Big blind checks, and I'm going to do a ton of checking on this board. I might even check my entire range. So I do decide to check, and Button fires out about $30. Big blind gets out of the way, and we flick in the call. Turn comes to 10 of spades. I check once again. Button now fires a big bet, an over bet of $240, and the action is back on us. 
Obviously, it's not a spot I'm in love with, but there is still a world where we have the best hand and we've got outs to improve. Also, given that we open under the gun, we don't really have too many 7x hands in our range. So if we do actually improve to a straight, Villain's likely to continue value bet in his sets and his strong hands and might even bluff as well if he has no showdown. So I flick in a call and the river comes to five of clubs pairing the board. So obviously we didn't improve, but this card does take out some of Villain's value combos, such as pocket fives or five six suited. I check once again and the villain announces all in for around $800. So I do take some time with this one. I really felt as though villain was up to something here. In terms of what he has for value, we're looking at basically just like full houses, like five, sixes, eights, and even pocket tens are all possible. I think if we're to hero call, I would much rather block one of these types of hands. Whereas we only really block 7-4 suited and 7-9 suited, and he might not even call those pre-flop. So after some thought, I decided to fold Villain Mox, which I feel as though meant he had it. He did seem like the kind of player that would just slam down a bluff if he if he was bluffing. But either way, I think we just have to fold here, so... So for our last hand of the session and the last hand I filmed in Las Vegas, we see an open to $30 from an aggressive rack in early position, a call from the hijack, and we look down at Queen Jack off in the big blind. Super easy to defend, getting a really good price, so we do take a flop. Flop comes king 10-4 with a couple of hearts, and we check the aggressor. The original razor fires up $40, hijack folds, and now the action is back on us. So, obviously, we're never going to fold. The way I would construct my bluffing range in these spots is to raise our best bluffs first. So what I mean by best bluffs is hands with loads of equity, but with little or no showdown. So my best bluffs in this hand, for example, would be hands like queen jack of hearts, where I've got an open-ended straight flush draw, but I'm currently just sat with queen high. Then hands like queen nine and jack nine of hearts, where we've got a gut shot straight flush draw. I also really like raising queen jack of spades, where we've got an open-ender with a backdoor flush draw, so that gives us some nutted hands when the board runs out with backdoor spades. So I generally always raise these hands, then work my way down, if you like, with weaker bluffs, such as weaker flush draws, or hands like queen jack with one heart. So with our offsuit queen jack combos, I would always choose to raise with the queen of hearts, sometimes raise with the jack of hearts, and not raise very often at all when we hold no heart. This way we choose combos that even block some of villains continues and also stay balanced so we're not check raising at too high frequency with our bluffs. Anyway, I hold the jack of hearts here and decide to just call this time. The turn comes ding, ding, fucking ding, the nine of clubs, and we check once again. Villain goes a bit larger this time, going for $120, and honestly, I should probably just raise here every time. I ended up calling in the end, mainly because I think check raising just looks insanely strong, and I like to balance my weaker hands here with some nutted hands, but just because the river can bring so many unfavorable cards that are going to kill the action, and the fact this is live poker, I should really just raise. So I call, and the river comes to jack of spades, bringing four to a straight, and this is exactly what I mean. So not only do we now lose to ace-queen as well, this card's definitely going to slow villain down when he has two pair, or maybe even sets. We can have a ton of queen x hands here like king queen queen 10 stuff like that so i do think leading this river for small isn't unreasonable but we're against an aggressive player in this hand so i do want to give him more incentive to bluff so i check villain fires out 260 dollars i think this is kind of a polar enough bet where i don't think he's going to bet a set or two pair and even if he does i don't think he's going to call a raise so for that reason i just flick in the call and villain shows us queen to a heart and we chop the pot and again, this is a hand that's definitely going to call a raise on the turn as well. So even though we would have ended up chopping the hand in this case, we did miss out on value on the turn when our hand was best. And guys, that's what's important in poker. It's not about the run out or the end results. It's about maximizing value on every street when you do have the best hand. In any case, we leave soon after and wrap up our final session of 2023. So now the only thing left to do is calculate the totals for the trip and see how we did overall. So obviously not the happiest session today. But let's face it, we'd won most of the other sessions. We were due a losing session at some point. We did claw a little bit back though. I think I was down around 5.5k at one point. So we end up cashing out. I think I was in for a total of $7,000 on the day. And so we cash out for just north of $3,300 meaning a total loss of $3,635 on the day. All right, boys, last day in Vegas. 
cash game results as follows. I think we played 10 sessions overall, maybe 11, including one of two five, which I didn't track. I think it was about even, but ended up plus, I think 1.8K, whatever numbers on the screen. Low sample size, didn't play that many hours. Didn't play well, to be honest with you, just given trying to get used to playing live again, trying to get used to actually filming and vlogging and stuff. So it's like surprisingly difficult, but a win's a win. So down something like 13K on the trip, including MTTs, but I obviously sold action in MTTs. I was up in gambling, so definitely lost on the trip, but could have been a hell of a lot worse. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you next year. All right, boys, that's a wrap. So GG, Las Vegas 2023. If you like this content, if you've enjoyed it, guys, just let me know in the comments. Please like, please subscribe because we'll do more of it and I'll play higher stakes. Happy to play 10, 20, 25, 50 if it runs. This week, I just wanted to chill and kind of just, you know, get used to playing live again. But if you like it, why not play higher? Fuck it. So yeah, make sure you like it, boys.